Hello, spacers. Welcome to Starlight, a space opera. I'm Isaac, your host and GM for the adventures ahead. This show, whether you're watching or listening, is a labor of love and one that we want to make the best for you. So if you can, take a moment to freely subscribe or share however is most comfortable for you. Thanks. Now let's plot a course to Starlight. Hi, welcome to Starlight, where I'm joined by my lovely friends. Here on my right, we have McKenna Ali, being played by Courtney Yorks. And on my left, we have the handsome and oh-so-amazing Clive Jensen, played by Sam Williams. And that leaves the most powerful in the universe, Atlas, played by Evan Goose. The strongest in the universe. The strongest. <laughs> No. in the universe for those of us who joined you. for season zero that was just the start the origins of this this adventure in space and through the universe of starlight for those of us joining us now going forward you haven't missed much but as you can see we have a new studio set up and we are so excited to bring all of our adventures to you without further ado let's jump into starlight <clears throat> Neuralink, access memories. Accessing. Having captured the notorious murderer, Dub the Painter, Atlas the Hulking Man, Clive the Out of Luck Cowboy, and McKenna the Friendly Loxodon traveled across the surface of Titan I. Hurrying to avoid the chilling cold of the asteroid's night, they were beset upon by carpus giant centipedes called Husk Takers. The three dispatched them and reached the detention center, for which the painter had escaped. Welcomed by a Yeth officer named Thiel Il Khan, they were given respite, rewarded, and an audience with the Federation's secret policemen, who gave them answers and means by with which they all sorely desired. Credits, a one-way ticket off the prison colony, and the location of the Sunmaker, a shadowy cult leader on the newly settled planet of Thela. Memories retrieved. So the camera pans down. You guys are in a cold, empty cafeteria. Most of the tables are folded up, similar to what you had in middle school, and pushed to the side. The door is just closed as the Yeth commander has left, thanking you for your service. There's like a gust of wind from the AC, and there's kind of like just some dull, resonating electronics of the, the, the technology kind of around you. The air is kept cold, probably around 40 degrees. Something that's not gonna harm you, but always keep you uncomfortable. Between the three of you, there are two bowls of ice cream. One is half melted, and the other one is in the hands of McKenna Ali. He told you that you would be able to find this Pilot at Bay 4. As the door hisses to a shut, there is lights that start to kind of come on. Flickering all the way up to you. And that's when you hear the whirring of robotics. And a voice comes on over a PA system. And it says, Hello. I am Sima. I am the AI system here on the instruction of Warden Yip to guide you to Bay 4. If you would please be so kind as to follow me when you are done with your chow, I will guide you there. And that's when you look down on the floor, you see at about regular intervals of about five inches, there are these little LED lights and they're set in a grid pattern. And suddenly they flicker uh, to life. Not all of them, just two at a time, creating a pathway. Shoo, 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 shoo. 
and it kind of shows you which way to go. It leads to the door. The door opens with a hiss. Take your time. And then you see a camera kind of swivel as it looks in at McKenna. Well, that's creepy. Um, so about your journalist role. My journalist role? You are a journalist, as you referred to yourself. And I'm curious about this. Real quick for the DM. If I wasn't tracking completely. When did I say that I was a journalist, or did they call me a journalist? When you went in to see the kid, you went in under the guise of a journalist. Yeah, I went in under the guise of it, but I never yeah. did these two that I was a journalist. No, the commander asked if you're the journalist, and you said yes. Gotcha, gotcha. Sorry, I'm just trying to track you in. All right. So what is the reason of the yeah. journalist? That is just one of my rules for the Acers. The Acers. Okay. And I'm going to get up and follow the lights. I don't know. You seem a little a little built to be just a normal journalist. But considering everything that just happened, I suggest we probably just get out of here as soon as possible. I don't know about you guys. I don't want to be on this prison planet any longer than I have to. Agreed. Yeah, as far as I know, I just have to report back. The information in the mission that was accomplished. Um, so as we start making our way, following the lights and everything, um, Clive is going to kind of keep his... He's going to kind of just keep an eye on everything. See if there's anything noticeable as we're walking to the bay or keep my eye on everything to make sure that there's nothing that's going to come out. And Just because Clive doesn't necessarily trust anything that's going on and doesn't necessarily trust the people he's even with at the moment. Sure, sure. So, as you guys start to follow, the robotic voice kind of just gives like a soft hmm. And there's a few steps, like you go down a couple of different corridors and eventually the humming stops and it goes, Did you like that? I was programmed to make my humans feel comfortable around me. I don't know if comfortable is the right word I'd use, but yeah, it was fine. Oh, more lights start to kind of pop up along the floor, leading you. There's like a cross section that takes you to the left. And I need you to go to make a perception roll. And you can make it with advantage, Clive. Uh, it's going to be 21. 21. So as you're making your way the down this hallway, you start to pass, not cells, but various windows. Most are clouded over, frosted, but one of them, you get a nice view inside. And what you see, and you're the only one that catches this, inside, you see Darren, the painter, his skin grayish green, strapped down, nearly completely naked. And he's on a just steel table. Around him, you see uh, multiple figures. You can't make out what race or anything like that because they're almost covered in a hazmat, completely white suit. Faces covered. You can see they have like oxygen rebreathers in there. And there's about three of them moving around him with uh, pins and papers and data pads. There's a few other people kind of a little bit away, almost overseeing it, but chattering amongst themselves. You can't hear anything. The sound is muffled. Make one more perception check for me, Darren. I mean, uh, Clyde. Six. Six. All right. You don't... You're not able to make out necessarily who it is that's chattering in, in the back as their backs they're, they're turned away from you. But you do see set behind them six various hyperbaric tubes filled with liquid. And the liquid's kind of a blue pulsating light. Inside of each of those, you see different pubs floating, asleep. Various IVs and things kind of going into their body. 
And then you see a bot arm drop from the ceiling and starts to kind of whir around Darren, and you can see it's moving ever so quickly, and that's when you catch that it's a tiny saw blade. And then you just watch as it starts to bury itself into his body. And just as the frosted windows start to turn, something flips a switch, you catch another figure being pushed into view on a gurney, and it appears to be a four-foot-ish drow, white hair and a scintillating tattoo, and he is knocked out and being gurneyed in next to the painter, and that's when it all frosts over and it becomes more like a wall. The computer's voice speaks up and it says, not far now. We will take the lift down to Bay 4. Now, uh, hold up one sec, Simo. What What was going on in that room? What are they doing to him? I do not understand. What room? And now you start to notice that the, the windows have, like, doors next to them that are numbered. And there's probably about six different doors, and they're all just labeled one through six. Now, the wind, the door next to the frost window was labeled four. Uh, w- room four. What was going on in room four? I noticed that they had that pug that we brought back to you guys. The lights that are lighting up, the green lights that are giving your path, just stop. Whereas, like, every step you took, a new one lit up to sh- guide you. It just stops. And you hear that simple, hmm. And then you hear a whirring noise. You look up at the ceiling. And you see as a robotic arm drops down, and this one has like a camera, and it starts to look sweeping at the different doors, starting at six, five, and as the head kind of gets to four, it shifts and stutters and just, (laughs) and then it skips to three, and it says, not computing, there is only one, two, three, Five, six. The warden is waiting. And then the next light opens up. And then the next one after that. Mm, there's something fishy going on here. But uh, I guess I'll leave it alone for now. He did say he was going to die. Yeah, it's true. But it looked like they were doing something else in there. It looked like almost body modification some kind. There's something else going on in there with those other those other tubes and those other plugs. But it's not important right now. What's important is we need to get off this ship. Agreed. All right, so you guys start to continue your, your walk following the lead of the AI system bot. It takes you to a repulsor lift, and the lift just starts to burrow deeper down into the detention center. Finally, it stops after passing about two floors. When it opens up, you come to a private docking bay. Here, on this docking bay, all is quiet. Multiple dragons sit about their cargo ships, fighters, transfer vessels, each one with its own unique exterior of carpet flesh with layers of hardened scale-like textures. They are all kind of a dull brown in color. Um, the nose of each vessel is actually somewhat reminiscent of a chicken's decapitated neck. And now you're, the camera kind of pans the center where your eyes are kind of drawn. And there, you see an even darker scaled vessel. This one appears to be a personal transport uh, ship. So it's not so big, um, but it, it's more like common standard way of getting around. Uh, there, there is a lift door that's open with some fresh steam just kind of coming off of the sides of the ports of the ship. At the bottom of the platform, you see an older woman. She has wisps of white hair and her eyes that they seem to have a calloused look about them. She's dressed in impeccable gray slacks and her uniform is pressed perfectly. There's a pinstripe ribbon on the hem of her sleeves that seems to demarcate her as the warden. You also see that there is a media photographer bot. This one is a tread bot. So the center of it is a almost dura steel circle. And then around it is a, uh, would be similar to like a tank tread, which would allow it to move all over the place. You can see the appendages of arms that have come out with flash photography and stuff. And as soon as you guys walk out, it just goes, and just 
just catches a bunch of pictures of all of you. The warden stands up straight, puts her glasses, pushes them up to her so she can see you a little bit better. And uh, she squints through and she goes, Oh, well, the heroes. Thank you for making it down here. I am Warden Yip. Please. The pleasure is all mine. Introduce yourselves. I have much to thank you for. I'm McKenna. Ah. Nice to meet you. Yes. Of the Loxodon from the ship. Yes. And she goes, You don't see many Loxodons out in these parts. Pleasure. The pleasure's mine. And who are you? She turns her eyes to look at Atlas. And there's another flash. My name's Atlas. Uh, I'm a journalist for one of the companies that was around this area. Oh, yes. You had the meeting with the kid, didn't you? I did. Hmm. Did you get your story? I did. Yeah, I actually had to get off this place so I can go report back. She kind of strokes a very strong jawline, and she steps forward. You can now see that she has a bit of a bad limp, and she says, Funny skills that the journalist like you has. I wonder, where did you pick them up at? Uh, I think just living or growing up in a rough area. Ah, me too. I grew up in the underworld. Down below the surface where the light never touches, in the slums. That's what made me hard. Let me get this position. But nevertheless, you are most interested. And she turns her attention to the cowboy wearing hat, Clive. Well, my name is Clive Jensen, and to be honest with you, there's not much you need to know about me. Not much that I'm willing to share anyway, except for the fact that I do not like my picture posted around everywhere. So if you could have your annoying little bot here to stop flashing that in my face, I'd greatly appreciate it. Me too. Well, that, that's my apologies. I just thought you guys are heroes and the media would want to know and have you posted in all of the galactic tablets. We're not heroes. All we did was bring you back your trash so we could get out of here. That's fair. You our trash, but we weren't expecting a pirate attack. And for that, we had much to thank you. She is... So, I have made sure that you would have transport to wherever you need to go. She motions back at the starship behind her, and she goes, I can see that you're all short on friendliness and don't really want to talk more. And she nods her head and she goes, I understand that we all have our own personal secrets and things that we must do. And I admit, running into someone and having extended conversations in the middle of a prison does not make for the most comfortable of meetings. Especially when one of you was one of my charges. Isn't that right, Prisoner 332? I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh, you don't? No, I, I woke up one day in the middle of a battlefield and I don't remember a damn thing. She goes, Amnesia. That is a handy thing to have in such situations. So unfortunately, and she pulls out a data pad and starts kind of sifting through it. She goes, did you show your friends this? And she lifts it up and you see Clive in the prison outfit doing work in the yard when he was more or less infiltrating. And she then closes it. <laughs> she goes, I too am inclined to be forgetful. I don't know how you ended up here. I don't know what crime you intended to start. All I know is that you hooked one of my men into your schemes. Horus. Uh, Horus, what'd you do to him? Oh, nothing, dear. Nothing. I would hate to reprimand him. He's such a sweetheart. He's somehow, probably... Somehow I don't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> look at me. You look down at her. She's a dwarf. And uh, she, her hair is just kind of shaved. She has the starts of a mustache. And she goes, 
would I do any such thing to one of my comrades? Yeah, I may not know you personally, but I've been around this planet a bit, and it seems like there's something shady going on here. So I, I'm sorry if I'm having a hard time trusting you. She goes, ah, I have a hard time trusting a prisoner who suddenly escapes in the company of others at the same time of a pirate attack, happens to bring back one of the, our prisoners, and then becomes heroes, and suddenly, not only has he roped one of my men, and he is erased from the files. Well, maybe you should be asking yourself if I was ever a prisoner in the first place. Oh, I should, but my pictures say elsewise. But I am inclined to forget, and you are not wrong. She raises one big, fat, puffy finger. It's well-trimmed, neat, but there's just something off about it. She points it at you, and she goes, You are not wrong. There is something terribly wrong going here. But it is not of my doing. It is of them bastards yet. She goes, I would like to make a proposition to you three. Perhaps it's just to this one. But if any indication, you all are short somewhat on credits. You need a ride off of, my, off of this asteroid, and you all possess serious skill. Look at what you did to the pirates. Look at what you did bringing the painter back. I would ask a favor for forgiveness and forgetfulness on my end with you and Horus, and credits for the rest of you. What do you say? Well, it depends. What are you looking for? Being a warden of this, this prison, I feel you have enough connections to get anything done, so why do you need our help? Because you possess the skills and means by with which to handle various outcomes that, contrary to your belief of me being this evil, big, bad person, I don't want to put my men in harm's way. We were having an issue down at the yard. Our minds have been safe for a very long time, but something has happened recently. Our foreman one of the prisoners who runs the place, has reported several times that they've had men go disappearing. Not only can we not have this happening, partially because despite what they've done, they are still people, but all the prisoners here are property of the guildsmen. And the guildsmen, they need that fuel extracted from this asteroid. So I can't just have them dying. Not if I want my paycheck, and not if I want the people here to be safe. The problem is, I have sent multiple tactical units and bot droids down there, and they've all come back destroyed. Or not at all. At first, I sent Crank with his own men down to go and try and figure it out, as the prisoners are the ones in charge of that area, and it's probably one of their only freedoms. But their men didn't return either. So looking at your track record, the three of you, I am inclined to ask politely if you'd be willing to do it. I'm not strong arming you. You can walk away right now. But I can't say that I won't report it in a few days that I had a prisoner walk away. I'm kind enough to give you a head start. I mean, it seems like an interesting proposition. Well, that means we'll have to stay on this godforsaken planet for, for a lot longer than I was expecting to. What do you think, Atlas? What do you think we should do? How many credits are we going to be getting per person? I was thinking somewhere in the sum of 800 credits apiece. 800? 800. Okay. He's a prisoner, or once was, so I know he doesn't have much. And she looks over at Clive. Huh. Uh, it's funny that you think you know anything about me. I need you to please go ahead and make a charisma roll. Uh, 
That's gonna be a nice hefty two. She smiles. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, I don't know anything about you, do I? Clive, she seems to know more about you than you know about you. Well, I guess I'm inclined to help you at this point. You seem to, you seem that you might know something that uh, I need some answers to. And I gesture to kind of pull her aside a little bit out of earshot, at least you. Please excuse me. I have matters to talk to. And as she's walking over, she starts to open it, the data pad again. And it's like listening to you while kind of like running through some information. No, I don't care so much for the credits. I'm not worried about that. And to be honest with you, I just met these two, so I'm not too worried about them either. But I do have one question. Shoot. Do you know anything about the makers? Or a special secret project they were working on, possibly called Operation Boundless? No, I've never heard such things. She finds what she's looking for and she goes, ah, I'm sorry I cannot be of more help. Although, if getting your attentions and your skills into this project would include me at least offering to help try and root around for information and drop it to your Neuralink, that is the least I can do for keeping my men and prisoners safe. And then she flips the screen just so that you can see Clive as she's doing that. Can both Atlas and McKenna make perception checks? <clears throat> that is a nat one. Yeah, I thought so. Seven. Eight or seven. All right, so you both don't see it. She kind of turns quickly. And what you see, Clive, is she set a loop of the replay of you cutting the gray's neck over and over again. She goes, that's murder. Even if it's of a prisoner. I just wanted you to know, and I don't know your relationship with these two, but I'd hate to spoil it by showing this to them. And technically, I cannot keep this and keep my oath as a warden. I have to share it. But of course, amnesia happens to people sometimes. Well, I think we have a deal if you can make that disappear and give me any information about anything you learn on this operation or these makers, I'd be glad to help you. I will do my best. She hands, puts her like mitt up to you and you notice that if this has always been interesting to you, but dwarves only have four fingers and she shakes your hand and she goes, it's a deal on my honor. All right. Well, after talking, I, it appears that she, the warden doesn't have any, uh, doesn't appear that she's trying to pull one over on us. And I think if it means we can get out of here without any issue, helping her probably wouldn't be the worst thing for us to do. Plus, we don't have a whole lot of resources. We don't have a whole lot of money. This could set us up perfectly. Well, I'm in. I'm in no rush to get to the Thaler colony. If you can make it a thousand credits, I'll do it. Ho oh, oh, a thousand. Go ahead and make... Make a persuasion check. Okay. Nineteen? Hmm. If it will guarantee your arm in that axe of yours, would you be amiable to 950? And just to clarify, this does include the transport out of, off the planet with the credits. Of course. And not sharing our faces around. That is a deal? One that I can most certainly deliver on. You think I want you on my asteroid any longer than you have to be. You are wrong. Except for maybe the Loxedon. She is probably the least sketchiest of the bunch. Just give it some time. Time. She goes, so deal? Yeah, it's deal. She raises her 
faint hands and shakes your... I'm going to test, actually, just like as a... I'm not going to try to damage or anything, but I'm going to like try to squeeze so I see how hard, like, how hard I can squeeze before either they, she says something or like can meet the... like. I need you to make a strength roll. Okay. Closing mine. Oh, do I add any strength stuff to it? Yeah. 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 Strength she got an 11. I got six. So as you go to just crush her hand, it's gloved. And that you, for in just a quick second, the moment you've, your hand starts to crush around it, you realize you're not feeling flesh, you're feeling metal. And you realize that her hand's been replaced. And you just get this sudden... <laughs> And she lets go with a smile, and she goes, strokes the side of the mustache that's coming in, and she goes, well, then let's go. Do we see this? Make a perception roll. See if you know this Atlas sweating. Atlas, make a deception roll. That would be an eight, a two, ten. Deception? Eighteen. Damn it. All right, Atlas, you roll an eighteen. So you don't even see. There's no sweat on Atlas's face. He just kind of smiles back as if just like... Yeah. <laughs> okay. So she takes you not onto the, the dragon that's open. She mm-hmm. takes you onto a land speeder. Uh, this is not anything like the dragons. This is fully metallic. You sit in it. It's almost just like your traditional sci-fi metallic thing that just kind of hovers across the ground. And just, the gates start to open. <laughs> You guys can see the expanse and the twinkling stars uh, overhead. It's cold outside, but you're protected within, and the vehicle starts to hum off. (sighs) The ride there is pretty uneventful. You... The warden makes some small talk with you, but it's nothing in general that's kind of like getting anywhere and she she so she tells you it's it's going to be probably about 15 minutes well before we get started you said that you sent out other teams of your men to take care of this problem and none of them have returned have you has there been any other information about what might have caused their disappearance or are you completely in the dark i am completely in the dark i've since my best to send drones down there to get information. Those have not returned. I have sent a few of my proctors down there. They have not returned. The only prisoner who has returned, well, you may interview him and see for yourself, but he is not in any state of mind to speak on these matters. What's his state of mind? It is more of something you need to see. But if this will ease your confusion in the moment, he's lost it. Okay. I would be interested in talking with him. Of course. Now, considering it appears we're going into something dangerous and unknown, do you have, by chance, any supplies you can spare us to ensure that we are able to complete our mission? I, I have some supplies. Although it would be up to the foreman to get those supplies for you. And she says, we can retrofit you with a few things to bad any injuries that you might receive uh, and some smaller arms. There's a, Even with our guards here, we do not keep them outfitted with many weapons. You know the orators of the Federation. And so, weapons of war. She kind of rolls her eyes and just goes, Weapons of war belong to the yes in the military. And, uh, can all of you make an insight check, please? Sure. Sure. Uh, 17? 18. Both McKenna and Clive, you pick up on the fact that when she says the yeah, it's it's in disgust. It's uh, she's not happy about them at all. So what is it about these yeth that uh, get under your skin so much? Ugh. They're a bunch of skin rats. All of them. They only came recently to our to my prison, and when they did. They came with, uh, well, you met him, 
Filial Khan. He should not have met you. It was my duty to meet you after leaving Bilbash Keep. But he's come and he started to take control. And he can wave around that stupid pin of his and cut me out of everything. He has higher authority. He has higher clearance. And he's doing weird things here. Do you have any idea who he works for? Or what organization he works from? Or is he like, is he in charge of the yet? He's a commander, yes. He works for the Sovereign. And as you know, with the Triumvirate, whenever the Sovereign is in power, the Yes ability to jump over others and crush them with their boot is extended. One more time, what was the name of the commander? Thiel Il Khan. Do you know what kind of projects they're working on? I know that they've been taking my prisoners. They won't show me what or tell me how. I know that they have been going over my head, taking control of of even some of my guards, telling them what to do when I tell them explicitly not to do such things. But as for the particulars, they keep me out of the loop. I've tried rooting around, I've tried getting access They've even cut out our AI systems. Hmm. That's interesting. I may have a little bit of insight on what they might be doing behind closed doors. Her head kind of jerks to the side and she goes, Hmm? The you? Yes, I, I noticed it as we were walking to the bay to get on our ship. There was one of these doors chamber number four where the window hadn't been frosted over and I could see inside. They had the prisoner that we brought back on a table and it looked like they had a bunch of medical tubes of some kind of mystery fluid with other pugs inside and they started cutting into them. And they were, I, asked, I asked your AI system and it seemed like when she panned over to that door specifically there was a glitch. According to your AI, that door doesn't even exist. So something's definitely going on in your prison. And as you say that, she kind of starts to sink ever more, her shoulders kind of coming up to her ears, and you can just see her seething in what she's hearing, and she goes, Those bastards! Every one of them. <sighs> you came from the cafeteria, yes? That is correct. That's the West Wing. And she goes, excuse me. She puts her hand to the back the base of her neck. And you know she's uh, interfacing with her neural link. And you guys watch as her eyes kind of go over a glossy blue. A few seconds pass and she goes, I've sent them in, I trust, to check it out. What you have said is a great boon. I will make sure you are all very compensated. And as uh, she says that, she points ahead and you can see the yard coming fully into the view uh, of the, the, the open um, windows. And what you see of the yard, even though Clive, you've seen this many times, having actually worked in here, it is, it is seriously a marvel of technology. It is characterized by a platform that rests roughly about 40 feet in the air and it's seems to have been grown the outside of it. it has like a dome that seems to be made of the same sinewy shell the dragons themselves are outfitted with you immediately tells you that it's somewhat symbiotic in nature however you know that up on top where that dome is is the facilities of the yard for those prisoners who are on duty that's where they sleep and stay until they get shifted off and go back to the detention center now this entire platform has a like spindly, almost like needle line that goes straight into a crevice in the in the asteroids. And this crevice is, you know, something on the order of the Grand Canyon. And as you reach the edge of the crevice, there is a like a, almost like a gatehouse, but made of like durastil doors that kind of hiss open letting you into a first chamber. The chamber kind of starts to equalize, warm up, and then the second door opens 
and you are able to park within another waiting bay. Immediately you see a bunch of guards, um, bunch being like eight or ten, but they're all posted so that they're watching the inner door. There's another door on the on the other side uh, from where you came in, and that door is smaller. It leads into a chamber tunnel uh, to a bridge that is a two-bike bridge that connects to the, the needle of the yard to where you can then take a elevator up or down into either the, in deep down into the mines or up into the temporary living quarters for those who are on shift duty. She, the soldiers all kind of salute the warden. The warden ignores every single one of them and starts to bring you further in. You walk across the tunnel. She presses a few buttons on the elevator doors. The elevator opens up with a shh, and you guys are able to ride the elevator up into what is almost like a small outpost camp. You guys immediately coming to the top, there is no door. Rather, the lift just kind of comes up through like a, a hole in the ground. And you can see that there are a bunch of bored looking prisoners milling about. Unlike at the detention center where they're held in confinement, they get to kind of wander around. And when they see the warden, most of them kind of scramble up onto their feet. And the warden looks over at you guys and she says, they're well trained. They know that proper respect is needed. And uh, she's walking by and she's 67. 822. She's just calling people by their numbers, not by their name. And eventually she comes to a a boy in his teens. He, he still has like some of the baby fat on his face. Uh, and he's growing the, the starts of his first beard. And she even doesn't call him by his name. She goes, 677. Where is Crank? Uh, I think he's in his quarters, ma'am. Go fetch him. We have someone to solve the problem. Or at least try. Oh, oh you mean the... Yes. Right, 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 right away, ma'am. And he gives her like a salute, like a sloppy salute that the guards gave, and then runs off. She goes, he's a good boy. Mixed up in the wrong things. And so he needs to pay for it. Order. And then shortly, he comes back with a another fella. This fellow, Crank, he is a just a gangly human. Um, he doesn't look like much. He actually looks like maybe he was like an ex druggy at some point, where you can see like the sallow lips that are kind of sunken and, and pulled in. Crank walks up and he goes, "Ma'am, heard you needed me." And she goes, "Yes. These folks here, I'm sure you saw the pirate attack. Not only did they help in dealing with that, but they held off husk takers." They brought back the painter. Ugh. He kind of like makes a bad, like a warding symbol. Like the name's just bad juju. And they have been so gracious as to offer their services to help clean up the mess that you failed to take care of. I expect you to keep me updated on it. Whatever they need, whatever we have, give them. Yes, ma'am. He salutes. She looks at all of you. And she goes, here, take these. Rum just through her pockets and hands each of you, like, these small earbud devices. She goes, I will be staying up here. And she, where everyone else is kind of staying in, like, these tent-like buildings, there is one building that has two guards on the outside of it, and it's, like, an actual building. There's no windows, no nothing. She goes, I hate staying here. It's like staying with the garbage. It smells. I will be there. These things have enough range. Keep me updated. I will try to give you the best aid that I can. And she holds it up. She goes, you press this button, and it will be a channel encrypted that the Yeth cannot get into. And if they can, then I'm more screwed than I thought. And she leaves you guys alone with Crank. And he's a, he looks kind of at you, just long shocks of red hair. Like, holy shit. A loxodon? This massive dude and... Don't I know you? As he looks at Clive. Uh, I don't believe so. I don't think we've ever met. 
I, I do get that quite a bit, so... Make a deception roll. Nineteen. He goes, oh, uh... You know, there's just a fella who looks kind of similar to you. But, um... No, never mind. Yeah, my uh, my twin brother did some, some time here not too long ago. Haven't seen him since, but that could be who you were talking about. I thought so. All right. So the warden, she updated you, I assume? Yes, somewhat. Can you give us more information? Yeah. Come here. He starts, he starts taking you to his tent and he goes, I have it all laid out here. And as he's walking by people, he's he's actually, instead of calling by the numbers, he's like, hey, Joe, can you go get me some some different uh, first aid supplies? Jim, how you doing? How's, how's your sister? She got into you, and you can see that he has like this relationship with people. Eventually, he takes you to the tent, opens the flap, and there's it's dimly lit with just like what are almost like uh, battery powered lanterns. And you see a table with a map of the mines kind of splayed out. And on the map, he kind of like goes down to like what looks like level four. And he goes, This is where we started having trouble. We found a our, our devices, and he points to a long stick that almost looks like a metal detector. We found a, what was going to be a new deposit of the uh, the ion deposits, and um, those are then turned into fuel. But So we were making our way to go mine those crystals. We had to first blow a hole down there, uh, make sure it was clear to husk takers, set up the different ultrasonic sound systems, and all that sort of thing. Normally I'd go down, but I was actually a little ill that day. Well, thank God. Because I love them all to death, but better than neck than mine. Because, uh... Anyways, that's when we started having problems. I thought that originally it was just a hus taker that had made its way down there through some network tunnel that maybe we didn't know about. And then I sent more of my men down there to deal with it. Second time, no one came back. Try again the third time. I asked for aid, but it's bureaucratic shit out here. I couldn't get the warden to do anything. She said, fourth time's the charm. But that's not the case. So anyways, third time, nothing. Fourth time, someone comes back. I sent Selby out there. He's a, you know, he's an okay fella. I don't really know what he did wrong, but he's hearted. Thought he could lead it, thought he could take care of things. We went with a squad of ten. They came back. <laughs> well, he came back. That's it. Came back in tatters. Came back bloodied. Barely able to walk. But that's not what the scariest thing is. He came back muttering the same thing over and over again. Help me. Help me. They're in here. They're around. They're in here. And then he would say it again, help me. Help me. And every once in a while, he sometimes says something different. It's garbled what it is. So then I get to thinking, it's not husk takers. If it was, my men would have taken care of it. A few husk takers, it's fine. There's something else down there. I want to be sent, finally, got Miss Yip to send down some bots drones and fighters and her own men they have the same problems not even her bots can make it back so then she assures me she's gonna get some one from the military to come or mercenaries or something and thank god you come because i'm supposed to go next and i don't fucking want that well where where is uh where is the survivor now is there a way we can speak to him oh yeah you can have your crack at that uh, head case. I'll take you to him now if you want. Well, I think, I think that's our, our first lead. Mm -hmm. We need to see what he knows and see if there's anything that can help us out. Because the last thing we want to do is go in there completely in the dark. All right. Now, uh, before we go and speak to him, the warden said that there might be extra supplies for us. Yeah, my, uh, I'm having him... I'm having some of my others go and, go and get them. Okay. He's what do you need, though? I What we have mostly is pretty basic stuff. Um, we do have some access to some things that you normally wouldn't be able to get, but even then it's 
Anyways, we have a few frags that you can have. That's military grade. But uh, let's just say the problem with it is, is it connects to your interface, which then uploads into the computer. So not only is it underpowered, but if you were, say, to misuse it, it tells the warden exactly who's the last person to use them. So I, uh, yeah. I've already sent plenty of men down there with those explosives, and you can try them. Other than that, we got plenty of some first aid, first aid supplies. Uh, I think we'll be happy to take the first aid supplies. I'm not sure we need the uh, the extra firepower, since it doesn't appear that that has helped. He glances over at Atlas, and he goes, if I can tell. All right. Well, why don't you come this way? And he opens the flap of the tent and starts to push through the crowd of, like, lazily working men. He takes you back around, like, the metal little miniature keep, and in the back, you see a metal metallic box. It has a, a two-pronged lock where you have to grab both the top and the bottom and then squeeze inward, and you so he <laughs> opens it up, and he goes, before he opens the ball, he says, make sure you use soft voices. He easy, jumps easily. Hey. Hey, Selby. You there, buddy? And it, you guys hear from the back, almost echoing out, you hear this. <laughs> and he goes, take it. It's all yours. Go talk to him. Um, McKenna, I think you should probably uh, take the lead on this one. No offense to myself or Atlas, but uh, we're a little rough around the edges. Well, I would like to say I'm pretty good with people, although I am quite large, so this might be a little intimidating, but yes, um, I'll go in. So you have to kind of duck to get in, mm -hmm. and when you get in, there is like just, it's more like glow sticks. There's an array of like five glow sticks. You can mm -hmm. see like half eaten meal, and you just see this figure rocking back and forth. You see that he looks to be half elf, probably in his 30s or so. Mm -hmm. And the only really distinguishing thing about him is he's more or less elf by now. Mm. I'm actually gonna use message before even saying anything out loud um, and say, hi Selby, I'm here as a friend. Can we help you? Harry. They're here. Help me. Help me. Please. Please. They're all around. Help me. Help me. Help me. Help me. Help me. Help me. And then he starts to scrabble at the sides of the metal. Selby, who is it? Who's hurting you? Go ahead and make a charisma roll. This is in their head out loud. Sorry. He's saying this out loud. Okay. Uh, that is a... Seven? Not good. He, um, without even like acknowledging you, he starts to scrabble into the metal, and then one hand reaches to his face, and you can see him pulling down his eye, and you can actually see this stretch mark now as his face kind of turns towards you, but he doesn't seem to even notice you. But you can see like the skin's been stretched from like many times of pulling down the face, and he says, oh, "Help me." I'm gonna try to grab a hand really gently, um, with, yeah, with, I don't, yeah, I'm gonna try to grab a hand, um, really, really gently, and say, Selby, it's okay, can you talk to me? Go ahead and make another charisma roll. Yes, that's much better. Uh, 19. <sighs> Help me. And he, he sinks into your, not only your hand, but your entire body. Mm -hmm. And you get the feeling that he's pretty emaciated. Um, whether that's from his ordeal or just how he is in general, he just kind of sinks into you. And he is just kind of rocking in your arms. And he just goes, yeah, they're all around. They're all around. They're in me. Help me. Help me. Help me. Help me. 
Sophie, can you tell me who it is? And he just goes into repeating it again. Atlas, will you please roll me a percentile die? Percentile? Yep. Die 100, die yep. 10. Fifty-eight. He starts to just, instead of scrabbling at the wall, starts to kind of thump his head into you. It's not hurting, but he's just kind of like, boom, 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 boom. He grabs his hair, and you can see chunks that have like come out. He just, <sighs> and for the first moment of lucidity, he looks right up at you, and he goes, "My God, I'm still there. I'm still there." You have to free me. And that's when he falls back into repeating the same things over and over again. Alice, do you know what's going on here? Do I know what's going on? Yeah. Clive? Um, can I see the guy like doing this thing again? Okay, so at this point, I'm just, I'm just going to like walk up. Alice is going to walk up. And obviously the being nice isn't working. And he's just gonna like grab him by like the back. Like, does he have a shirt on? Yes. Okay. He's just gonna like grab and pick him up. Okay. And then he's just gonna basically like lift him up to the wall, and just ask him, um, "What do you mean you don't want to turn in or be what they are?" All right. So you lift him up with a boom. <coughs> yeah. You're holding him in place, very violently. Yeah. And I need you to make an intimidation roll. Okay. I said to talk softly. Well, that wasn't working. <laughs> What is that? That's a four. Four plus two, six. Oh. His eyes, they look at you, but they look through you. And they just, he just says, you have to help. You have to help me. Help me. Help me. And his hands kind of start to scrabble at the sides of your, your, your jacket, grabbing tufts of the fur. And he's almost like, like a death grip, but not intentionally harmful. Just this guy is scared. So scared. Out of character real quick. The neural links that everybody has in their in their bodies, are they visible from the outside of like the skin? No, they're not. They're embedded directly, like infused into the spine. Okay. The uh crank calls out from back there back further away, and he goes, hey, you get anything out of him? No, it doesn't appear he's going to be any help to us, unfortunately. Uh, he steps forward and he goes, that's what that figures. That's what I said. I'm going to, um... Are you able to? Oh, I'm going to yeah. get him down from Clot, or... From Atlas? From Atlas. How are you going to get him down? I'm going to take him down. Um, can you both make, if you're going to hold it, both of you make a, a, a pose strength check. <laughs> no, if I can see that, if she's coming up to like yeah. grab him, I'll just let go of him. I like to kind of like toss, brush him off. All right, so he like kind of slumps into your arms, not even paying attention to any of you again. That lucidity just completely gone. Shelby, we need your help. Help us. Help us. Make a charisma check with disadvantage. Okay, and then this will be the last. Seven, it's... Oh, that's a... Both sevens are ten. Uh, help me. Help me. Help me. So I'm... Yeah, yeah Alice finish. is going to, because of working with the acers, he's going to walk up and just grab the guy's like head mm -hmm. and attempt to hack into his neural link. All right. Go ahead and make that roll. So you guys watch as Atlas grabs him. And there's just this splash, almost like a fuzz across Atlas's eyes, just like a tsh. Um, interfacing skill. Yeah, you're gonna roll your interfacing skill. Hmm. Nine, because it's minus one. So as you start to try and hack into his neural link, you are met with a pretty standard uh, neural link defense where you just can completely shut out and just and he just you don't understand 
Help me. Help me. Does he get aggressive? No. Oh, okay. Just the voice. Okay. I think I'm going to say, Atlas, it seemed like you were a little aggressive in your attempt to interface. Um, I'm not even going to touch him because I don't think you have to. You don't have to. You just got to nope. be within uh, 30 feet with okay. front of side, I think. I feel like we're a good cop, bad cop. <laughs> um, so I'm going to try to interface with him gently. And then I'll probably leave the room if this room work. Okay, go ahead. 22. All right. So, your eyes kind of glaze over, glitching as well. Just, <laughs> you are met by the firewall, and then suddenly it starts to quell down as you start to kind of hack within to his neural link and get some of the memories that he has. And you start to siphon them, almost pulling them into your own hem- like neural link and downloading them for you to see. There is a small voice the computer uh, within your head that says 50%, 60%, 70 all the way to 100%, and that's when it's downloaded. You're able to let them go, and the memories start to flood in to your mind. You get flashes of him going with 10 other people. There's some humans, there's a few that are younger, some that are older, all male. They go down the lift into the mines. It's as everything should be. It's a, you know, it's normal within the mines. But there's this, you can feel his heartbeat. There's this anticipation, knowing that three other ways have gone before them and none have survived. A small sweat starts to break out across McKenna's back, like brow, as she's feeling almost some of what Selby felt. They continue to walk, each footstep echoing within caverns. Caverns that are both stone and have been laid with steel on the floors to make the grating easier to walk. But then you hit the lift, a lift that is very archaic in nature. It's just meant to get the job done. There's no bells or whistle. There's a simple lever. You push it and you start to pass through many levels that are have been mined and they look about the same, but you come to a stop at the fourth level. The fourth level, this is all natural cavern. There are a few things laid out here. You get images of like some explosives for opening up new areas and you get an overwhelming fear. Images of a uh, dark cavern ahead, twisting turns, and then the sound of skittering. Someone yells out, Hustaker! Hustaker! There's images of the firefight. Getting down on your knees, hiding behind a rock, jumping up, taking a shot. You're not even able to make out Hustaker clearly. You see, Selby's a coward. And when he sees multiple of his comrades, prisoners get pulled up into the air by this thing that's ambushing them. He runs. There are a few others that run with him. They can't run back to where they came. The mistake is behind them. The only way is forward. Him and three others start running. Heartbeats just like almost coming out through them now. And they, the whole time they can hear the sounds of like body parts being just mutilated. Destroyed, cut in half. And this terrible sound of many feet chasing after them. But in the darkness where you can't see them. One of the people next to him gets pulled up away into the darkness. Just... <laughs> And you hear this terrible... <laughs> they continue to run. They pass through a, another corridor. That's The tunnel's rough. There's some. There's like a faint shimmering in the walls that seems to mark maybe what they're mining. It's like a light blue. It's providing enough light. They stumble into a bigger chamber. One of his... The other comrade, the only one left, gets stuck in the thin air. He seems to be fighting against an invisible force. You can't make it out. There's too many shadows, but he's just like animated. One arm up, one arm down, fighting. And the more he fights, the more he seems to get stuck. Selby keeps running, running. It's warmer now. It's hot, humid, and it stinks. It smells of putrid flesh. There's another cavern ahead. He continues to run. And that's when he sees a cave in. What he first he thinks is the end. 
there's a small gap on top, something you can climb up into. He starts climbing further and further up, and the little sensor, the blip that helps them find the Ayun crystals, it starts to just go haywire. Just <laughs> as he comes into this rough, short room, and the last thing you see is the largest, like before where there were just veins of that stuff, you see an entire conglomeration of it, an entire wall made out of it, and it's warping and moving with almost life of its own, and suddenly all the fear saps away from him. He hardly notices the other dead bodies around him, and he starts to walk towards it. It's almost whispering to him, enticing, please come closer. And when he does, he steps forward and touches it, and everything, everything goes dark, and all that's left is fear, but at the same time, unity. And then you <gasps> flash back into reality. Do I see him come back at all, or that's it? That's it. That's like where you pick up. Wow. This guy's had a whirlwind, and I think we should leave now. Um, I am very, I'm not able to communicate what I just learned at the moment. I am like struck, and it's very, very obvious um, that I am shocked by what I just saw. And I leave the room. So McKenna just walks away after having gotten the, the memories from, uh, from Selby. Selby just falls again, this time amidst his pile of glow sticks, and just, now he's not even sitting up, he's just muttering at the ceiling. Help me. Help me. We're gonna help you, Sully. I don't think we're gonna be learning anything else. Better go uh, check out McKenna, make sure she's okay, find out what she learned. Clive's gonna walk out of the room. Um... I can tell you what happened to Selby in terms of why he's insane and what we should not do when we go down there. Um, A, there's husk takers, takers down there and they're very aggressive. Um, so we shouldn't we should try to avoid them. We need to figure out how to avoid them. Um, also, there's an, an invisible force that fights people and picks them up in the air and and fights them and it looks very un, not very fun um there's also a gap in the ceiling as we go deeper in that gets hot and smelly um there's dead bodies everywhere and and it brings you into a, a crystal wall thing that makes it very enticing to touch the crystals we should not have the crystals. Um, we should really, really not touch the crystals. Um, that is why I'm assuming Selby's insane. He blacked out from there and I have no clue how he got back here. Um, but it's something about a large amount of those crystals um, really affecting him. Not what I was expecting at all. Neither was I. I was just expecting more of the, 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 the yes. Um, but this is, I don't know if this is the workings of the yes, or if this is just weird geology, but it is weird. Hmm. Maybe we need to, uh, maybe we need to first learn a little bit more about these crystals that they're mining for fuel. Yeah. It seems like this, whatever whatever the link is between what happened to uh, Selby has to do with these crystals. Maybe we can um, at, talk to Crank about that? Yeah. Do you have thoughts? This is your mission, so I'm just letting you do it. Seems like you're the only one that has to get out of prison for the most part. I'm just trying to get money out of this. Well, that may be true, but uh, 
the only way you're going to get that money out of this is if we complete it. Well, my only idea is that if necessary, then I'll just go down to the cavern or the area that needs to be checked out. Well, Atlas, you can be my guest because uh, I'm just going to say that does not seem to be the smartest way to go about it, considering there's tons of people that have disappeared and considering what McKenna just saw. It sounds like there's a invisible creature of some sort, or invisible force, and then the husky takers we've already fought them. Crystals, it seems like a just do not touch situation. But For the husk takers, if we can figure out, if I can figure out the frequency it takes um, to make them repelled by the area that we're in, I think that would be an easy solution to not have to fight them because fighting them is what took out a lot of those men. It seems like she wished the warden wanted those us to figure out what the problem was and get rid of it. If we just make it repelled from yes. that area, once we leave, it'll just come back. Well, just so we don't have to fight the husk takers, because the husk takers are down there all the time, um, and are what miners are having to deal with. I well, they're not normally in this area, I think. Oh, okay. From just, that's why it seems like the warden wants us to clear out the area. Yeah, let's... Well, it... Crank did mention something about ultrasonic devices that they set up when setting up these mines. We could ask him. They probably set it to some frequency that repels the mm -hmm. husk takers. Yeah. And then, uh, I guess we don't have, really have much else to go on besides that. But yeah, we talked to Crank. It doesn't look like we're getting off this planet unless we go down there. So I suggest yeah. we go talk um, to Crank. Prisoner, what phone number was? 677. Prisoner 677. I'm not going to comment on that. Oh, what is his number? Oh. Um, his number uh, is 332. Oh, my, my fault. 332. Anyway. I forget what number you I think we should about. go uh, talk to Crank. Let's see if we can get any more information before we go down there. Is that a good plan? Yes. Crank. Did you get anything out of that? Yeah. Judging by the way you walked away, it wasn't. Wasn't too good. Crank, what can you tell us about these crystals? The crystals? Yeah. We mine them. That's For why what? we're here. For what? Hell if I know. It's the guilds thing. I think they use it and render it down into fuel for dragons. Mm -hmm. For hyper travel. But they don't tell us anything. How is it usually found? Oh. With uh, any motions over, as one of someone else is walking by, and you see like a little doohickey kind of, it's a long, spindly arm with a sensor on the end of it. And he goes, With one of those. Do you find that it's typically in small amounts or large amounts or. How is that? Diamond crystals? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I wish it was found in large amounts. It's in these tiny, small amounts. And we have to go deeper and deeper always. And how does it affect someone if it, it's in larger amounts? I, I don't know. No one's ever found anything. And like, what's what's a large amount? Because he looks around and finds a rock on the ground and he holds it up. It's about the size of his palm. He goes, "This is literally the largest I've ever found of one of these." Wow. Um, Crank. It seems that Selby may have found an entire room. Four of these. Make a persuasion check. Uh, 16 plus 5. 21. 21. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, wait. You serious? Yes. That would buy my freedom off of this place. But, Crank, the dilemma is that when he got close and he touched him, it would... Well, before he touched him, it, it almost made him touch him. It made it so appealing that he didn't recognize the, the several dead bodies, which I'm assuming are your men, around the crystals. And then he touched it, and his mind went blank, which I'm assuming is how your men died. They saw the wall, and they were excited, and they thought exactly what you thought. And then... And then they died. I think there's something terrible about these Ayun crystals. You think that the crystals killed my men? 
I think something about the crystals in very high amount. I mean, entire room filled amounts does harm. Well, you're the mercenaries. What, what, do you, what, should, what do you think we should do about it? Well, I'm hoping to learn more. About the About the crystals. Has there, has there been any incident in the past for any of the miners? Has there ever been an incident where one's wandered off or felt like something was calling out to them? No. I've never heard any... I'm having a hard enough time believing that there's an entire cluster of them in one place. Oh, it's not a cluster. It's a room. A room. I'm I'm sorry. I believe... I'm having a hard time believing you. I'm going to be honest. So, no, I have no idea. So, wait... If you're having a hard time, believe her, it would actually be a lot helpful if we had a guide, so how would you come with us? And then you can see the room for yourself. Make a persuasion check. Two. <laughs> that was going to seem like again. Do I look like you guys? He holds up these like thin, gangly arms. He goes, I could turn to pieces, torn to pieces down there. And now you're telling me there's some magical thing? Uh, I'm going to leave this to you. Well, here's the deal, though. It sounds like that if we go down there and we don't make it back, you're going down there next anyway. So either way, Ooh. Ooh. you're going to have you're going to run into some issues. I think it would be best for you to come with us now while you actually have some people who can protect you. Make a persuasion check, and I think that's a pretty good one. So do it with advantage. Clive Jensen? You are a very intelligent man. I've been around a lot. Uh, so it's going to be a 12. But... Uh, I'll show you the... How about I take you to level 4? I don't want to go near this crystal. But, I thought you didn't uh, believe that was there. Let's reevaluate at level four. Let's get there and see what things look like and, and reevaluate. Oh. All right. Okay. One of the 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 thirteen year old boy comes running back with some gear and he just looks at him and he goes I want you to bring double. Yeah. I'm going down. And the kid just looks at him confused and runs off again to go get some more supplies. He goes, all right, you got me. We'll get the supplies. We'll go down there. First aid supplies. That's it. That's what you wanted, right? To keep me safe. There seems to be a frequency that has takers stay away from. Well, yeah. Can we bring something that addresses that concern? Because Selby... And those mm. ten men also ran into a very incredibly strong rust tank. But you think that I just haven't thought about that? All of my men have gone down there with that. We, we can, can bring them. That would make you feel better. But I highly doubt it's going to work. I'm curious. From your knowledge, or like from, say, Alice's knowledge, of like, like any, do I have any for rust takers? Mm -hmm. Um... Is there is it like a is it like a colony type of animal or creature or is it more of a make a make a biology um, check? Okay. Uh, what is that? That's a one. It's zero. Oh, yeah. At Atlas, you've you've heard of like husk takers in passing. Yeah, uh, it's. I fought one. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah. They bleed. Okay. They bleed. They die. They screech. All right. I do have uh, one more question for you before we decide to venture down into this mine. You said that you have these devices that tell you where the crystals are, are at, these these machines that you carry down there. Sure. Do you have any idea what exactly those machines are detecting from mm. the crystals? He starts to think about it, rolls a natural one, and just like, I don't know, you point it, and it beeps. Mm. On, off, off, on. And where do you where do you get these these? We'll call them scanners for now. Where do you get these from? 
guild provided. I mean, that is the whole reason we're here. They say we're here to reform. What they mean is to do their dirty work. Slave labor. Hmm. Now, all these supplies that you guys get from the guildsmen, does it have to go through the warden before it, before it gets here? Oh, I'm sure. I mean... I'm surprised they even give us any sort of frags. Alright, well... I think I'm gonna... Out of character. Those, those devices that the warden gave us, they have they gave us the ability to contact her, right? Yeah, on a private okay. channel that supposedly, hopefully, Yath can't get into. Alright, well... I think we should get prepared, spend some time getting prepared. I'm gonna step away and get in contact with the warden and see if she knows anything else about these devices. It might be, give us some sort of information on what these crystals or whatever they are transmitting, because who knows, that may be the reason why Selby's, uh, let's just say he's lost it a little bit. I was also thinking it could be some sort of massive illusion um, that someone or something is created in that room so that then lures people up there and kills them. Oh, great. That's what I... The Slab Highs will be here in a second. I am I am going to go get myself outfitted. I'll, I'll be right back. And he stomps off, grumbling to himself, to his tent. All right, I'm gonna... Clive is going to step aside, and he's going to uh, get in contact with the uh, warden. Okay. So you click the button, and you hear a voice that... At first, there's like a quiet line. Shh. Yes. Hey, uh, Warden, before we're about to make our way down into the mine to see if we can figure out whatever whatever issue we're having, um, it appears it might be something much bigger than Hus Takers. I do have one question for you. These these devices that your your prisoners use to detect these crystals, do you have any idea what kind of energy that they're actually detecting? What allows these devices to pick up crystal location? Yes. It's a, uh, gives off a frequency, an electromagnetic wave. It's simple. The hertz is oh, it's pretty low, and the sensors pick it up. What's more amazing about it is it's able to repel other inputs. And it's as simple as that, basically. Now, based off your knowledge, do you believe that if these frequencies hit high enough or were collected in a large enough quantity that it could possibly interfere with someone's neural link? That is, a, that is an interesting question, but what's a large amount we're talking about? Well, let's just say there was a, a whole wall or possibly a room full of these crystals. Hypothetically, of course. Hypothetically? Hypothetically, I would say no one's ever seen something like that. Well, if that, if hypothetics is true, then well, that's uncharted. Our uh, McKenna took it upon herself to try to interface with Selby to see if she can learn anything else. And Based on his recent memories, he may have just found one of those rooms. And it could explain why he's come back uh, a bit crazy, as you could say. The line goes quiet for a second, and you assume what is probably her thinking. And finally, it kind of crackles back to life, and she goes... If I was in my right mind, I would call you crazy. But in the past month, I've had the Yeth come take over my hold... I've had pirates attack, I've had an airbus full of people to shepherd, and I've had people lose their minds. So, I will go with their hypotheticals. Of course it's possible, it's giving off some interference, but the Federation does not make faulty neural links, so that would be a damning. I have an idea. Normally, Aeon crystals are found in small fragments. What if you try to take some explosives down there, chuck them in, and blow it to fragments, 
something that's safe for collecting, but is no longer coalesced into one giant mass. Mm. Well, do you have the? Uh, do we have enough explosives to take care of something like this if it ends up being a much larger resource? Darling, I'm the warden. Well. I know me no disrespect, but it doesn't sound like you have much control over your prison here at the moment, so... Make... Make a charisma check. Watch your tongue. Hey, now. You will have everything you need, and then some. And then the calm goes silent. <laughs> oh. Well, the warden said, I uh, spoke to the warden, it sounds like she uh, said that it could be an electromagnetic interference problem. It could have caused, hypothetically, it could have caused Selby's uh, reaction to what he found. Apparently these crystals transmit low, low frequencies. And in my, my opinion, if these frequencies were intense enough, I do believe it could wipe someone's narrow loop and make them go quote unquote mad. Could it also kill? Now that I don't know. Because there were bodies in the room. My hypothesis on the bodies was, was that if, if these husk takers are attracted to frequencies, maybe the, whatever these crystals are given off is a frequency that they, they are accustomed to. So that could be where they're just leaving all their dead bodies for future food. That makes sense. And as you say that, you guys see Crank walking back. He's still pretty spindly and skinny, but now you see he's wearing his inmate outfit, and it's, you know, it's the, the dull gray, but it has, like, small orange highlights on it. You can see it's a thicker material, and... It is made to help kind of keep you warm if you get um, stuck in, let's say, not good places. He walks towards you guys, and now you can see he has stuffed it, his like the front of his chest and belly and his back, with what must be pillows. And he goes, "All right." He has a makeshift helmet on. He goes, "I got it." And he holds up two cases. Of uh, like some medical supplies, uh, and ha like, because you guys are handling the weapons, and so I'll handle these. And that's when you see the keep open, just the doors, you know, normal size door opens, just the guards get on high alert as the warden walks out, and the warden walks out with a small briefcase, walks very quickly stomping with a bad limb up to Clive and just hands it to him and she goes stay in contact and when she hands it to you it's heavier than you expected and she just stomps off in a dark mood well I think I may have pissed her off just a little bit I'm gonna pull uh, you two aside um, separate from so, um, crank. crank and say I'm not entirely sure it's a good idea to bring Craig down. He seems full of fear and not full of courage, and bringing fear down seems very unwise. And he, he put pillows in himself. Yeah, you know, you may be right. Uh, we were going to use him as a guide, but it sounds like once we get down there, there's not... Too many places to go and get. So there's an invisible husk taker, right? Or something? Or something invisible? Yes, but I. So I mean, we don't. Let's be honest with each other. What can this man with no. be used for? No, no. You no, know, I typically don't like to go that route myself, but you may, you may be you on know, something here. Real quick, it's I'm gonna turn to ours. Craig and ask him. Be like, how fast are you, Craig? Uh, a uh, real good at running. See? Well. Atlas. It is not the kind of thing to do to bring a vulnerable, weak man, who is obviously a coward, 
down to a place where he will almost guarantee, he's almost guaranteed to die. He has a life outside of this cavern and... What, prison? Yes. Now let's think about and this He's a though. living human let's being. Let's make him a hero. So basically, he's in, he goes down there with us as bait. Let's just, I'm just being honest about it. As bait. He comes back to the warden with us. Alive, crippled, whatnot. But he is now going to be released from prison with some credits in his pocket. Yeah. What do you think he prefers? Atlas, if you can confirm that with the prison warden, then I will be much more on the same page. To theorize about this man's freedom is rude. Well, just remember though, if we don't make it back, he's going down next. Yep. Do you want him with us and or by himself? Make, he definitely won't make it back. If, if we don't make it back, he's definitely not going to make it back. I and was... like, like Crank said himself, better their next than ours. Mm. I refuse. And he's quick. To believe that we're not going to come back. Well, if you also refuse Wait, to believe she... you would yeah. sneak on the mercenary ship and get shot down by pirates. No, well, also I you always saw... that was a possibility. But you also mentioned, remember, you seeing a hus taker? Out of all three of us, who got taken out by a hus taker? You are a very mean man, <laughs> Atlas. I'm just being honest. So either Pelloman here and can Atlas, run faster. I am going, <laughs> Pelloman. I am going to the bottom of you in your journalism, and I stomp away. <laughs> so pretty big stomps. Too. <laughs> All right, Crank. And then I like put uh, my arm around Crank and be like, "Are you ready?" Ah. Uh, yeah, I will be honest though. So, like with Atlas, obviously you had that persona. He is gonna lean over to like crank and be like, like basically tell him that if anything does appear, he needs to run as fast, like run towards him, like me, like run towards Atlas. So, I can do that. I can do that. Let's just get this over with. I'm gonna put a message in his head really quick that says, "Crank, you are the strongest in the universe." I want you to make a. Uh, Make a charisma roll. I'm not gonna live it down. It's just gonna keep going bad. Um, that would be a oh, uh, eleven. He just kind of looks around, like he said that, but continues to walk with Atlas as he starts to lead you guys to the elevator doors. He opens it with a hiss. You can see that the to get to the main level to leave requires like special access, but he can easily get down to the mines. Presses the buttons, and you guys start to descend further and further into the mines. Now, as you guys are going down, the air gets colder. Um, and eventually after passing first floor, second floor, third floor, you have the elevators lift, hiss to a halt. The machinery, which was quite loud, being archaic as it was, falls quiet just as quickly as it started. Crank looking around nervously, he says, so this is where we started. He takes your first steps out of the lift and you can see that the floors have been evened out. Some of it has been mason and you can even see like where there's like crates and stuff nearby and tables with some maps and stuff like that and supplies. Um, under his arms, not only is he, is he carrying the first aid supplies, but he also has like a tripod with some sort of device, probably for emitting the sound under one arm, as you guys asked. And he very quickly leads you out of these more mason-like halls into the complex itself. You can see where the prisoners had once started work and it stopped. You can see tools, supplies just left there askew. Um, and judging, uh, judging by the amount of initial just eye drones, these small circular one eye antenna uh, machines that kind of hover around, that this that even though the mines are left to the prisoners to work on, it's watched at all times. Now, as you start to get further in, the eye drones, they seem to have almost like a, like a place that will not pass. And you start to see hunks of machinery that have been destroyed. And probably it's the guild saving their budget, not wanting to send more machinery to get destroyed. Um, Does this look all look really similar in terms of what I saw in Selby's 
Neuralink by Hacton. Yeah, this is all so, super similar. So you eventually pass through more layers of rooms, deeper, until you find yourself in an immense cavern. All the walls and flooring are rocky in nature, but there are dim green glow lights set up regularly in places that allow you to ever so slightly see the iron-like twinkle of the asteroid's core just glittering about. You can also see small webs of sprawling what must be the veins of Ayunum Stone, just a faint beads of blue that almost just look like uh, veins that whisk through. But there's nothing weird that it's just pockets. Um, the space is wide open, natural slopes and curves, and it is pockmarked with holes as if tiny worms had gorged themselves upon the rock. The air is warm and thick. What do you guys want to do? Set up the frequency thing. So Crane kind of like goes, oh, right, right. Um, he sets it down and as he's kind of looking around, he goes, so that's where they went and he points ahead. And you can see like as the tunnel on the far end starts to funnel and uh, kind of turn into another passageway. He begins to press the buttons when Atlas, you hear the sound of like a swishing. It's a very soft, but it almost sounds like the flapping of leathery wings. And he, you see that uh, Crank is still in the middle of the room because that's like the area where he can get the biggest radius effect. And he's just punching the code in for the frequency. And uh, where can I, where am I hearing it from? Like which direction? I want you to make a survival check on that. Survival? Yes, right. sir. What does it say? I think it's a three. Don't say that. Huh? Don't say that. Was it three? Yeah. Alright, three plus four, seven. Seven. Pick a direction. You're unsure. Act. Never mind. I was gonna say it's like a danger sense, but that's only for some stuff. Um. Okay, so Crank is in front of us, correct? Mm -hmm. At the key code, and then there's two, there's like behind us or forward? Or is that he's, he's ahead of you. Okay. So Crank is ahead of you, and past him further yeah. is the funnel, like entrance to other parts of the cavern. Okay, gotcha. Um, I'm gonna say. Left. Left. Okay, you immediately look over to the left side, you just see just, just a bunch of darkness, not nothing that you can pick up. And that's when both Clive and McKenna, you see this swooping shape that starts to come down. It looks like there's two of them breaking the darkness of the ceiling caverns. And again, now you all hear the flapping of those leathery wings. It's not like it's trying to be any, be quiet at all. It is a rock-like entity, uh, almost reminiscent of a dragonfly but the front, instead of like, with these big beady eyes, instead of having like a normal manful mouth, it has almost like the, uh, the sucker of a mosquito. And it's whooshing down as Crank is trying to press the button. He's completely unaware. You both have one shot to do something before. Oh, uh, I am gonna just pull out my, uh laser rifle and take a shot at whatever it is that that leather bat thing might be. Okay. Go ahead and roll an attack roll. That's gonna be seven. <laughs> seven? Yeah. Alright, so you take the shot and it shoots off wildly. The, you, that's now, you're alerted to that as you, your eyes are drawn up, Atlas, and you see these flying things, four-winged, and it just has no screech, no nothing like that, just a funnel, like, as it's swooping forward. Crank's attention is drawn back to you as he goes, oh, 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 and he stops exactly what he's doing. He just freezes. McKenna, what are you going to do? I am going to firebolt it. Um... 
and it's a cantrip, so I think I just roll the dice. Right. The you still need to make an attack. Roll. Okay. That's and then you add your spell attack. That would be a eleven. Eleven. Firebolt goes arcing by, slamming into the side of the wall. The all right. These creatures, one of them comes down, misses uh, Crank, who fumbles to the ground, getting knocked down. He falls ground prone. The other one almost lands nearly on top of it, the wings unfurling as it takes an attack and just sh- its stinger shifts and snaps right into his kneecap and he lets out a scream. And you just hear the sound as that sucking noise. Now you can hear the blood just. I need <laughs> everyone to get ready for battle. Alright. Atlas, will you please roll me initiative? So you have the two different creatures. Uh, one is directly on the ground, right next to a Crank. The other one is about 10 feet up in the air. What do you want to do? I am going to assume Atlas is going to address, address the one that is on top of Crank. Um, and I'm going to try to create a minor illusion that draws that other one, like, the opposite direction of wherever we're headed. Okay, what is that going to be? Um, us going the opposite direction. Oh, just you guys running opposite direction. Yeah. Okay, cool. So you guys watch as this like small burst of, of probably what is clot and the the trace hints of the other people running the opposite direction. All right, and that's it for you? Yes. Atlas, you're up. All right. Um, yeah, I'll be, Atlas will see that Crank um, was not like basically injured, and he will. I will actually rage. So I am gonna rage. Um, and so then, you, you're gonna see him down. You're gonna go rage and go after him. Go after yeah. Okay. Go after the other one. Yeah, right. So you guys watch as the lines on it, the blue lines flash just this bright red, red. and he just goes running there. Basically, yeah. Just to see Atlas with the blue lines all turning red, and then like starting to s- steaming or steam coming off of them. And then I'm gonna take my attack on this one. Three plus four. All right, so your attack of seven misses as you swish wildly, just maybe catching the little bit of the wing. Crap, I should have said. All right, the Sturge who is uh, over to the side, it goes, Flapping now, straight towards Atlas. So, it tries to sink its finger, sinking its finger right into Atlas. You guys watch as it just catches a little bit of the arm there. Atlas, that is two points of damage. Is that after my resistance or no? Uh, no. So it's one. So one. Yeah, but you can't. Wait, wait, wait. What kind of death? Piercing? Piercing. Okay, yeah, that's one. All right, Clive, you're up. Alright. Uh, Alright, so um uh, the one that's there's still one that's flying, right? Yes. Okay, the one that's the, flying, Clive is gonna load um special ammo into his laser rifle and some of the nanobots from inside of him are gonna wrap around one of the, the cartridges and he's gonna use Hunter's Mark on using bonus action he's gonna use Hunter's Mark on the one that's still flying. Okay, so the in your vision, the your eyes kind of flash like an almost unseeable red, but it's almost as if you will get this like heat map wave coming off of the creature itself. And then I'm gonna go ahead and roll for an attack on the door. Okay. So seven, shoot, shoot, it misses. Again, the creature is 
its attention isn't taken, and the one that is over Crank now, it goes, makes its attack with advantage, but at this time it sinks its stinger right into the ground next to Crank, and he just <gasps> and starts scrambling backwards. McKenna, Do will it. you please roll me a percentile die? Die 10 and die 100. Yes. That would be a... Is that a... That 107? Is a, yes. Crank looks about wildly. <laughs> and he just goes... Get, a, get away! And he starts scrambling back towards and like pushing the creature back. And he starts pounding more inputs into the system. You just hear like this... Beep, beep, beep. And you can see he's almost done getting the inputs into the system. Clive, will you please roll initiative? All right, so the first, there's the one that's grappling now with Atlas. It rears its head back as it sinks its stinger into you again. That is four points of damage, so two. Two? Yep. Clive, you're up. I'm gonna make it take another shot at the one that I've marked. Seven B. Oh. So that is a hit. You go ahead and roll for damage. All right. So with that hunter's mark on there, I think of extra dice six. That's gonna be uh, six damage. So. Six damage. All right. How do you want to kill it? Um, I'm basically, so where in relation to it is, is Atlas? Atlas is, it's literally like on top of Atlas. Like it's just, it's, they're basically inhabiting the same space, but it's just hovering above him while Atlas is trying to push it back with the haft of his axe. So I'm as it's, basically going to just run up next to it, shove my barrel in its face and blast its head off. All right, so you run up just as it's about to rear its head up and put the stinger back into Atlas's body. You shove the barrel into the stinger and just... <laughs> and you guys watch as the back of its head is just... All right. This one over here, the, the remaining search that's currently that? trying to attack... Uh, yeah, that, that one's gone. The one that's trying to attack Crank. Getting this loud noise, this ringing. It seems to not even notice. It's one-minded, hungry appetite. And it goes ahead and tries to sting into the side of Crank again. This one sinks into the side of the pillow. And you guys watch as it pulls back and just tufts a feather go... And Crank just goes... Ah! Ah! Not today! <laughs> McKenna, you're up. Um, I'm going to firebolt that one that is on top of Crank. Um, yeah. Don't roll a one and hit him. What is that? A oh, seven. Uh, like a one. Seven. It's eleven. Yeah. All right. So again, your fireball <laughs> ricochets off. When this one hits, you guys watch as the cat. Like you just hear this echo <laughs> from the shot of the fireball. Atlas, you're up. All right. Clarifying, there was nothing that made me. I know we were doing that for to figure out the thing, but I wasn't prone, was I? No. Okay, I was just gonna. Oh, I just wanna, no, no, you're good. You're good. I didn't know it was to figure out the image of it. Um, I'm gonna just yeah, I'm just gonna swing at it. All right, go ahead and make an attack roll. I'm gonna use reckless attack. Oh, Ooh, okay. So look at advantage. <laughs> yeah. Natural twenty eighteen. Go ahead and roll for double that damage. Good roll. That's probably the best roll we're gonna get all day. Yep, I used both of mine. Okay, so it's D. D12. Okay. This is D12. Yep. Sorry, I'm trying to figure this out again. Six. Twelve. Plus your rage of two. So, yeah, no, yeah. with plus two with rage, it's so D12 plus four plus two, so that'd be uh, 12. And critting is what? Is it times two or is it just another? It just doubles, so you have 24. Yeah, so 24. Okay. Is it, you rolled a six, you would double that for critical, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's so 12 eight. plus your 4, 16. It's How do you. Two. Am I wrong on that? Yeah, no, it's just d12 plus 4 plus 2. Because rage is plus 2, plus 4 is just my modifier. Yeah. So. so that's 18. Just 12. Yeah. So go ahead and roll. Or how do you want to kill it? 
This one? Yep. Um, if they seem to be like weak creatures, I'm just like gonna like back swat them with the axe because I'm more worried about Crank. Okay, so you back swat this thing, kind of like more worried about it's like a Crank. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's it's you pull it's him fun. out of the way. He's just about to press the last button, and just as he gets it, you guys hear the these noise get emitted. Then he gets thrown with Atlas's just like titanic strength, and Atlas is, is just like looking. At Crank, not even looking at the creature, he backswings and just lops it in half. And it just falls <laughs> to the ground, its body just still. <laughs> and that is when Crank's just like, oh, oh, oh god, oh, oh, Revers, oh, what a rush. <sighs> you see, Crank, now imagine what would have happened if you had to come down here by yourself. Thank you. Thank you. And the the, the husk taker stops fidgeting as the goo starts to kind of come to a, an end of pulling around the body. The edge of it coming to Atlas as a boot. Will you all please make a perception roll? That's exactly what Sobe ran into. Uh, 15. Eleven. So, 17? McKenna, you hear something. I need everyone else to leave the room. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Uh. And it's gonna be awesome. Secrets abound. Oh, I'm excited. What do you think you hear? Skittering. Skittering? I'm almost out. McKenna, what you hear, it's ever so faint. It's the sound of a screeching, high pitch, just. And then you hear the sound of just. And it seems to be echoing from the funnel like entrance on the other side of the cavern. Will you please roll me another perception roll? Um, a nine? Okay. There's just a strange wind that seems to almost change from the cavern. Your eyes are drawn back up as you look for more of those flying creatures. And you see four bodies hanging by invisible threads, almost half cocooned. And that's where we're going to call the game. Okay. So everyone, thank you for tuning in to Starlight. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of Starlight. If you enjoyed this, please like, share, subscribe. For early releases, exclusive RPG content, and other bonus material, check us out on Patreon at patreon.com slash starlightadventures. And to reach us for questions to be aired, email us at the starlightadventures at gmail.com. See you next Tuesday, spacers.